This is our third mini lecture on the topic of the Oedipus complex as uh, reconceptualized in Lacanian terms and I've entitled it what is the phallus because the phallus is going to be an important concept uh, an important structural feature in how Lycon wants to reconsider the Oedipus complex. We ended last time with this idea that it must be at some level potentially a little bit accommodating uh, experience of love and nurturance if everything depends on mom if mom is this uh, all-knowing all-caring all-able all-important figure in one's life but we also try to suggest that maybe at some point that might be somewhat suffocating and I made the reference to Darren Leader's What is Madness when he suggests well maybe this sense of being completely uh, controlled or overwhelmed in certain situations that experience is something that seems to be apparent also in moments of psychosis but i think what we want to do now is highlight what we could say as two different lines of motivation two different kinds of impulses we have set the stage by suggesting that there's a need to create some barrier some division some kind of separation between the child and the mother or the maternal caregiver primary caregiver and we've tried to explain that there's some good uh, social symbolic reasons why that's, that separation needs to happen. The, the kind of highfalutin uh, uh, anthropological term is like the incest taboo. But I think if we're going to get a sense of the nuance of Lacan's account, there's both a kind of push and a pull element here. There's both the sense of if one stays forever within the remit of the mother's subjectivity, the realm of the mother's desire, although that served one very well when one was a kid, a kind of almost uh, survival question, where's mom, what's she up to, starting to formulate uh, some kind of hypothesis. What is mom's desire? Why does she always seem to be looking at her phone? Or why is she always taking these calls? Or why does she do this? Or why is she always away at this time of day? Whatever it may be. That kind of hypothesis takes us to what we could call uh, a guess as to the desire of the mother. And I've suggested that it's both desire and lack, which is a nice, important qualification to remember when doing Lacanian theory. Desire and lack are coterminous. They are, in a way, the same thing. There is no desire without lack. And you could say that uh, lack is characterizing of the fact of desire as human entities. We lack, we desire. But nevertheless, I've tried to suggest that we need to keep in mind two crucial structural features. One is the name of the father, which you could say is uh, the installation of symbolic prohibitions, rules, the values of a society. This is the kind of law of the father, the, uh, the prohibitions that come within a given cultural location. So that's the kind of push away. But there's also a kind of, in a way, just to characterize it very bluntly and in not a particularly nuanced way, you could say this is the kind of negative feature, the imposition of law. It's not really negative, but you get my sense. The other is the, the, more, the, the more pull element, and that is that if my subjectivity is only within the realm of my mother's desire, there is nothing that my desire can't be realized. So there is something about the attraction of desire, about finding a desire outside of my mother's desire. And that's the element that we will refer to increasingly as phallus. So just to make those two points before we move back to our diagrams, you need two features, crucially in Lacanian theory, to understand how this barrier between mom and me uh, is fortified, how this move from the dyadic imaginary, imaginary relationship intensity of maternal love with me you need two features. One is the name of the father, okay, the, the, the stamp, the installation, the, the conduit of social laws, prohibitions, language, norms, conventional understanding, so on and so forth. And this element of desire slash lack, this element of what in the Kenyan theory we call phallus, the signifier of desire, the signifier of lack. Let's do a little bit of work to try and explain those two things. We've already looked at this, that in these moments when there's absences in maternal attention, the child finds some way of registering, makes sense of these absences, these gaps. And those guesses, that ongoing process of uh, uh, the hypotheses, the guesswork, the thinking, the understandings, leads us to what we could say is the desire of the mother. And just to reiterate, this is something that's kind of crucial. 
because rather than sort of falling back into the absence of the mother in some kind of absolute utter dejection, one starts to have a sense of like how things work. The more one is able to, as it were, theorize or guess where mom is, what she does, the more one starts to get a sense of who she is. But presumably, the more that work happens, it also proceeds along the line of, well, mom is not herself complete. Mom herself is not mega all controlling. Mom is also defined by some kind of desire, for desire for something beyond me. And if she has a desire beyond me, presumably she's not complete. She herself is lacking. She herself is not uh, uh, all encompassing. She herself is defined by a certain kind of lack, a certain kind of desire. I wonder what that is. So that's our first scheme, our first step, you could say, in thinking about this Oedipus complex. We move now into the second, which I've called explaining this beyond. If mom is interested in something beyond me, what is that thing? And here I've reiterated my diagram. Here's the dotted outline. When we have maternal absence, we lead to a question mark. What is the desire of the mother? What is she doing? What does she want? What is interesting? And in the second stage, I've now put the child in a dotted outline because the child's presumable response is to say, she seems to want something or be interested in something outside of me. But I want her to be interested in me. So I'm going to try to locate myself slam bang right in the middle of that desire. What does she want? I'm going to put myself there. Maybe, going back to Black Swan for a moment, maybe that is, she seems to be very interested in something to do with ballet and dancing. I'm going to be that thing. I'm going to epitomize in my very being. I'm going to incarnate within myself the thing that she finds desirable. So this is something what... The, the, the second stage, in a way, you could say, of, of Lacan's revisiting of the Oedipus complex, where the child, as it were, takes it on as their ambition, uh, it's not intellectualized as such, but to be the very thing that encapsulates that desire. And I've called this the Jerry Maguire moment, sorry, but Jerry Maguire's got this famous line when uh, Rene Zellweger just goes weak in the knees, Tom Cruise has been a bad boy, or whatever happens. And he comes back and he says, I love you. You complete me. Wonderful Lacanian moment, because, you know, this is what obviously is trying to happen here. It's a Lacanian moment in part because it's impossible, but never mind. The child is going to try and do that. They want to complete the mother. They want to be, as it were, the apple of her eye. They want to incarnate the very thing, the very image of what seems to epitomize her desire. So maybe, and this could take an infinite variety of different forms, and it could take an infinite variety of different failures, because as we'll see in the third uh, diagram, it inevitably fails. It wouldn't work. How could you possibly ever incarnate everything that the mother wants? Maybe the drama, the anxious, stifling, suffocating uh, feel of Black Swan is the situation when, when one almost succeeds in doing that, and then it becomes very difficult to pull one's identity apart. But nevertheless, the child tries to do that. And in, if we had to be more intricate with Lacanian theory, you could say that this is the moment where the child tries to be the phallus for the mother, by which we mean tries to incarnate the very image. So it would be the imaginary phallus, to be a little technical for a moment, tries to incarnate the very image of what you think the mother desires. Maybe that happens. Actually, now I'm having a little moment when, why do I sometimes... Anyway, never mind, never mind. But are there moments when, when someone tries to be exactly what some important other person wants? That you try to live up to that thing, the, the bright, clever, uh, all-attentive, uh, industrious boy. Suddenly I'm having this like, oh my gosh, why did we start talking about this? But anyway, there is the, as it were, as we're dramatizing it, the, the, the Jerry Maguire moment. But for Lacan, this is never going to fully work. And thank goodness it doesn't ever fully work. Because by its very nature, desire is not going to be satisfied by the one image. And rather than being stuck within this kind of imaginary dilemma of always attempting to epitomize the most wonderful image of the mother's desire, the mother's desire keeps on moving. It seems to be pointing somewhere else. At the third stage, then, oh, I haven't filled this in here. It should say phallus and signifier of lack. In the third stage, yes, mom has still got this desire. The child now is kind of separated from this 
a hopeless attempt to ever completely encapsulate that. How are they separated from that? Well, here along is this axis of the father. The father comes in here, and it's more of a trajectory of a vector. It's not necessarily the dad, but as much as it, it's, it's more the dad as being the name for symbolic prohibitions, for cultural uh, uh, norms uh, of those various injunctions and uh, prohibitions which need to separate the child from trying to be in this imaginarized heavenly epitomization of the mother's desire. So that comes in the way. And moreover, I try to put an arrow here to separate both the child from this attempt to be the mother's desire. This now fails. And I've also tried to separate the, the child from the mother's desire by this trajectory of the father. But now we could say something else starts to come into play. The name for the mother's desire, you could say now, is phallus in as much as, for two reasons. One, there's a sense that this mother's desire is often somewhere within the vague ambit trajectory of the father, of something within the symbolic that will separate child and, and mother. And of course, once again, it doesn't have to be the literal father. It could be any number of things that relate to the symbolic domain, the same symbolic domain that is the anchoring of the name of the father. But also, we call it phallus here because it's a signifier not just of desire, the mother's desire, but also of her lack. Now, I mentioned before that uh, Darren Leader was, I think, the best way to, to, to try and make this introductory um, exploration of this theory. So I just want to read a, a, a passage which hopefully will explain some of this. So this is on page 61 of What is Madness? Leader says, both the boy and the girl, talking about how I have depicted this stage, both the boy and the girl must now learn to give up their efforts to seduce the mother, to be the very object of a desire, and reorganize their world around certain, uh, a certain insignia, interesting choice of words, insignia of the father, which they identify with. These provide a new compass point, a way out, as it were, of an ill-starred situation. Okay, so it's almost as if this appeal to something that we'll call the name of the father, is, is a kind of rescue for a situation that's, that's hopeless. Interesting that he says the insignia of the father. And you'll remember when we spoke about the name of the father, we were interested in the seal of the president, the divine right of kings. There's something associated, some symbolic element associated with the father, which is not a literal father. He continues, for both the girl and the boy, this transforms the relationship to the mother. And of course, that's the whole agenda that we've been trying to explain. Firstly, the child registers that the mother is not all powerful, but that she is herself lacking. And secondly, this lack of the mother is named. The father's function here is to make sense of things. It allows an interpretation of the mother's desire. It gathers the thoughts about her into a set that is constructed around the father and specifically the phallus. The phallus here is not the real penis, but a signification, an indicator of what is lacking, an index of the impossibility of completion or fulfillment. And I just wanted to stress that point. I've tried to, this line here is separating the child. And it's kind of like their access to this signified lack. I can no longer simply embody what my mother wants, but I kind of have now got the message that's impossible, but that there is some desire. There is some lack there. That is a crucial compass, a way to get my bearings. But I'm not able to do that simply within reference only to my mother. The, the role of the father of prohibition, of cultural norms has got in the way. And so now phallus is somehow reinscribed in a kind of different way. It's got something to do with father and it's got nothing to do with the penis actually. What it is, it's a signifier of lack, a signifier of what I don't have, a signifier of desire. And not just the mother's desire anymore, it's now been mediated by, you could say, the uh, the presence, the question mark, the imposition of these paternal or symbolic values. Leader goes on. I just want to emphasize that again. The phallus here is an index of the impossibility of completion or fulfillment. In a way, it's, it's the, a kind of insignia of impossibility. I can never simply be everything that, that, that is linked to that kind of desire. As such, 
The phallus has no visual image. It can't be caught or clearly defined. Remember before I was saying that when we're talking about desire like that, it's always a guess because you can't simply encapsulate it. I've said this about signifiers. It now takes on a more fundamental value of loss, what cannot be and cannot be had in the present. Always out of reach, it's a way of symbolizing incompleteness and thus introduces a sadness into the child's life, but also an order, a symbolic framework that will allow the child to progressively move beyond the world of the mother. So that's what I really want to emphasize. There's also something quite sad, almost something quite tragic about what's happened in the Oedipus complex. You've given up on this incestuous love relationship of desire and uh, a plenitude with the mother. You've had to give up, give it up in a sequence of stages. And eventually what you're left with is not even just the mother's desire anymore. That's been thoroughly reformulated after this imposition of the name of the father so that there is desire that's functioning, but it's got the imprint of symbolic values. It's got the imprint of uh, the law, the name of the father. And what it leaves you with is a kind of little black hole. It leaves you with a sense of impossibility. So in the kind of poignancy of those lines, just going to read them again, always out of reach. This is, the, this is now the phallus. Desire as it has now been, in a way, uh, reformulated through this process of uh, the name of the father. Desire now, which we'll now call phallus, is always out of reach. It's a way of symbolizing incompleteness and thus introduces a sadness into the child's life, but also an order. A symbolic framework that will allow the child to progressively move beyond the world of the mother. So yes, there is a sadness. Phallus is always failure. Phallus is lack. Phallus is incompletion. But now that it's the phallus within the domain of the symbolic, because the name of the father has been installed, it also starts to give us some reference point, some location of how one might situate oneself in one's own desire. That, I think, is why uh, Lida here is right to stress it also gives us an order, a symbolic framework that will allow the child to move beyond the world of the mother. And this is why, let's move to a conclusion, that at this point in the theory, we can talk about the paternal metaphor. And without getting into a whole other long, arduous technical discussion, let's simply say that what we're dealing with here is what had previously been the compass of the how to locate oneself in the world of meaning. It had previously been the desire of the mother. Through this process, the separation between child and mother has been, as it were, enforced. And what now starts to take precedence, the compass of being, the compass of subjectivity is no longer simply desire of the mother. It is now the, a different set of sensibilities. It's now the name of the father. So when Lacan is talking about the paternal metaphor, what he means is that what had been crucial, name of the mother, has now been pushed down, not completely obliterated, it's unconscious, it's repressed. That's been pushed down and the kind of grid of intelligibility, the map, the cognitive map through which one engages the world is now much more determined by the name of the father. In other words, how one is installed in the symbolic. Yes, phallus is still there, but phallus is now desire as it could be realized in my own sense within the coordinates of the symbolic domain. It's no longer simply the desire of the mother. It's now a, a, a desire and capacity that is always about lack, incompleteness, and uh, that I will strive for within the symbolic domain, not simply reducible to the mother.